If you're a listener on this podcast right now and you know that you have no business holding a hammer or driving a screwdriver, you need to get your hands off of that and find someone else that can and use them and pay them because I promise you, you're going to spend a lot more money trying to figure it out or all of that time wasted wondering if you can afford someone else to do it. The answer is you can't afford to do it yourself if that resource is not in your toolbox. Welcome to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association, providing benefits and services to real estate investors and rental property owners for over 48 years. With your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. This episode is sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And RCB and Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. Hello and welcome to episode 353. My guests today are a husband and wife team who started investing in 2018, and they found financial freedom through buy and hold rental properties. Now, Tiffany and Eric Vogel have released their first book called The Pathfinder's Journey, The Key to Your Dream Life Through Real Estate Investing. And they've wrote this book to encourage new investors to begin their own real estate journey to their dream life. Tiffany and Eric, welcome to the show. Hi, Brian. Hey. Thank you for having us here today. We are eager and excited to be on your podcast and to to get to know you a little bit and to share a little bit about what we do. Well, why don't we start with you guys telling us a little bit about yourselves. How did you get started investing in real estate? It sounds like you started in 2018. What led up to that? It always sounds like I'm just kind of bashing Eric, but it's all affectionately done. He moved out of a house that he had a VA loan on. And he'd only lived there a year, so there was no equity. So he was advised to rent it out. And when he did, he did not do anything right from a property management perspective. Didn't collect the rent checks. The tenant was putting them in the garage in an envelope with cash. So there was just thousands of dollars of cash sitting in the garage waiting for Eric to go pick it up. And he didn't. So one night we were kind of hanging out and I was we were just dating. So I was like, how's that going, by the way? And he's like, yeah, I probably should go pick up some rent checks. So I was just kind of started researching and said, there's got to be a better way, a better system somewhere online that we can collect these payments and got into it from there, just started researching and studying and found bigger pockets, learned a lot there and realized we could make a life of this and build our dream life. So we went pretty much full force from there and started buying up some rentals. Yeah. Shortly after she dove into it and, you know, brought the proposal to me of we could do this full time. You know, we kind of turned everything in our life off and just focused on real estate investing. We read books. I listened to audiobooks. We listened to thousands of hours of podcasts and attended countless hours of webinars and online seminars and just really dove in, started attending a, a local meetup. And it wasn't six months later we bought our first property. And then it just, it kind of snowballed from there. The first year we bought one or two, and then the second year, six or seven, then the next year, six or seven. So it just, it really just, it kind of happened off of accident. It was not an intentional decision to become real estate investors, but it is a happy accident, as Bob Ross would say. Is that Bob Ross, <laughs> the painter? <laughs> So a couple of things in there that you mentioned. So Eric, starting with the fact that you're a military veteran and you were able to access the VA loan. Talk about that a little bit. How powerful has that been in your investing? In our investing space, we haven't really used it up until very recently, as in today, <laughs> because you can only really have one VA loan at a time or so they say. And so we didn't utilize that VA loan for any of our investment properties, only the first one because it was my primary residence and I couldn't move out and, and I couldn't sell it. So that that has been a great thing. I mean, the cash on cash return is insane because I only brought 180 something dollars to closing. So that, you know, in numbers wise, that was an awesome deal. Moving forward, we have actually just closed on a on a burr by re rehab, rent, refinance, repeat to ourselves. And 
by taking it down with private money and doing a big rehab on it, we are now going to be selling it from our business to ourselves in a VA package with all of the built-in equity on it. So we're actually moving in a couple of days into yeah. that house. So, mm -hmm. But it's it's one of those tools that, that we do have a unique access to that we're able to move into this dream house of ours with with no money down and be in a in a situation where we're experiencing a home, you know, that's three quarters of a million dollar home for far less because of that VA. You're closing on a home with a VA loan here very, very soon, or you're you're about to. And that's going to be a burr that you're going to live in while you rehab it. So we took it down with hard money, with private money, about three and a half weeks ago. And we've already bought it in our business. And the rehab has been going. And this Friday, in a couple of days, we're going to be moving into it. So we're going to rent it from our company until the VA is closed. So we will rent it from our company and then buy it from our company using that VA program. Tiffany, I want to go back to kind of all the thousands of hours you both spent early on researching, going to conferences and probably paying for, for training. If you could talk to our listeners who are going through that same process now, what are some of the takeaways you have from that experience? Where did you find the most value and where did you not find any value during that process? We started with the free content or very cheap, just podcasts and books, and realized very quickly that we were wasting money by not going to seminars and spending that extra money. A couple thousand dollars can get you a network of like-minded investors that can help you along and just a, a great education that will probably save you tens of thousands of dollars in the future. We got connected with a group out of Florida. They all are students of Jack Miller. So we follow Bill Cook, Dykes Bodiford, David Tilney. Those have been our core teachers. And we just kind of stay within that circuit and learn from them. Still, like last, last month, we just came back from a trip learning on a creative deal structuring just with the changes in the market. We want to make sure our toolbox is ready to go. But I... I wish we had invested in education more early on, but we had a scarcity mindset of, well, we need that money to put into our homes. And I think we would have saved a lot of money and a lot of time if we had put more into education early on. Where did you possibly lose money because you didn't have that education early on? I think it would be deals that we did not pursue. We left a lot of money on the table on deals that we couldn't figure out. And we couldn't figure them out because we didn't have the education or we didn't know the right people. So by going to those seminars and courses, we would have had the education and met the right people to either do it ourselves or bring them in and do it with them. People who get into real estate quite often get into it because they're seeking financial freedom. And if my understanding is that you both have sort of achieved that financial freedom through the real estate you've been doing since 2018. And I'm wondering if you can kind of take us through the reality of that evolution, like that first property that you bought, not the VA one that you bought as your home, but the first investment property. How were you able to afford it? How were you able to turn it into a cash flowing property? And then how were you able to ladder up to more properties? So you're buying six or seven a year kind of step by step that six months of educating, like that hard pressed educating, we were attending a real estate meetup very consistently. We didn't miss a single meeting over those six months. So we were building relationships and and just exposing ourselves to the the networks. During that process, we were looking at homes and we were getting we had one under contract that that failed and lost a couple thousand dollars, but we didn't give up. We kept going. But people in that group could see that we were moving. And when we found the, the first intentional property and we had it under contract, we talked about it and we shared that with other people and said, we need money. We have this deal. We need about 80 grand. And we ended up finding a private money lender that trusted us because A, they may not have trusted us, but they trusted that the contract was good because we got it under contract for so far less than the future value, the ARV. ARV. I don't know why I couldn't figure that one out. The, the ARV, which is the after repair value. So when we found that contract, when we found that deal and got it under contract, money 
seemed to be easy to find because it was such a great deal. We It was a two bedroom, one bath with a detached garage. We added a bathroom, we added a bedroom, not by adding square footage, but putting up some walls and adding some plumbing. And then the detached garage was an unfinished two bedroom, one bath. So we just finished that up. And it was a great value for fairly cheap. And when the private money lenders saw how much value there was to add, they had no doubt that they could just lend this money to us. So we used private money to take down the property. We borrowed money from our retirement accounts, which wasn't a lot. I think we ended up borrowing like 40000 from ourselves to fix up the property. And after we got it repaired and we got it rented, we refinanced it into, I, would, I will call this corporate or commercial hard money, which is a 30-year fixed note at a competitive rate, but still an investor rate of like 7 8%. And we got it into that. And we were able to pull back most of our money in that. And that property cash flowed about three, $400 a month. We had the experience. We had built the relationship that when we do a deal, we pay our private money lenders back. So it was starting that system off. The next deal that came up was our triplex that we bought. And that was a home run of a deal. We Just a very quick snippet of that. It went on the market for 130 something. We made an offer for 125. They rejected it. They took it off the market. They brought it back on the market for 75,000. Brought it back on the market. Six months later. Six months later, they put it back on the market for 75,000. We made a full cash offer, got it under contract. I don't know why they didn't revisit our initial offer, but hey, we won, right? So we put in about 30. We were 100,000 all in. So we put in 25 and then it appraised at 200. So, so we were able we to cash out yeah. a healthy amount. We took that 50,000 in cash and we're able to use that as leverage to buy more. And so it's just that snowball started building. And that second deal that we did with that triplex was a really that was a lot of snow adding to that snowball and we were able to really, you know, build momentum and drive forward with that. While you were starting this off, what was your financial foundation that you were working from? Did you both have jobs? How were you able to pay your bills while you were building your portfolio? I had a really good corporate job in data and analytics. I worked from home, so that gave me some flexibility that if I needed to go out to a property, I could. So that definitely helped. It was a healthy income so that when our first property was not a true burr, we had to leave some cash in it. We had the savings because of that income. Eric was a high school band director for eight years. And so that was also a, a good income that helped supplement it. So we were working our jobs. We put a lot of sweat equity in. We were working ourselves at the properties for the first probably three or four. Yeah. We were doing a lot of the work and learned quickly that I do not need to do drywall because it looks terrible. <laughs> so a lot of lessons learned there, but Eric became pretty good at doing some light plumbing and electrical and all the the complicated things that I did not want to learn. And so I guess between a combination of good W-2s and some sweat equity, it it really helped propel us. And Tiffany encouraged me to leave my job only in the first 18 months of us doing real estate investing, because I was so involved in the business that my time was better spent on those properties. And her income was twice mine. So it was easy for us to live on the little bit of cash flow we had on those first three properties and use her income. And we we definitely cut our spending. We we cut everything down, bare bones. We even lived in a in a camper for about seven, eight months where we just we rented our primary house out, lived in a camper, bounced around from house to house to house. She would work out front of the camper, which was parked out back of the rental property. I would go to work on that rental property. She'd be at work underneath the the camper awning. And we bounced around several houses like that and just lived this life of, you know, it was like a nomadic life of just sweating and working. And it just, it seemed to go on forever. But now when when you can finally look up and say, Okay, where are we? <laughs> what state or you know what what state of mind are we in right now? I don't know. And then we finally sit down in front of the Excel chart and she says, "Hey Eric, we're in a good spot. Let's look at getting a house now." So we then ended up buying a a house where we utilized the FHA 203k program where we bought a really rundown uh, house in in a historic district of our city. 
and use that 203k program to renovate it and all of that was financed at a really good rate and we were in we end up living in it now but we're moving out of it we've satisfied the one year 203k fha standard of you know requirements and this property now will become another rental let's talk about the fha 203k loan Uh, tell just give us some insight into what kind of terms you're able to get and what are the requirements to be able to get that type of loan it was a 30-year fixed i want to say it was at the time around 3%. It was low, and very nice. We had to have a general contractor do the renovation. So that was an adjustment for us because we were used to managing our contractors or subs and, and doing some stuff ourselves. But we actually, at the end of it, wound up refinancing out of the 203k into a conventional loan because there was enough upside and we wanted to get out of PMI. So we wound up, I believe we're at like three and a quarter on the loan. So renting it out now, it it does cash flow very well because you can't beat that interest rate. And then we had so much upside from add value because we bought it so distressed and we put a lot into it. We now utilize a HELOC, a very healthy home equity line of credit that helps us fund other deals in our business as well. And to your listeners out there, I would say, you know, if you have equity in your home and you're planning on using a home equity line of credit, we call them HELOCs, you need to be very careful on how you how you utilize it. Ensure that you are very responsible in how you're using it because at any time, those HELOCs do have a call and you got to be prepared to you know tackle that as, as it comes. So don't use your HELOCs to go buy toys. Use them to buy assets that produce income. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about Green Property Management. Not only do they manage everything from single-family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area, they also manage my entire portfolio. So I can tell you from personal experience that their unique flat fee management style is worth a closer look. If you feel that your property isn't operating to its fullest potential, then Green Property Management can help you take a holistic approach that will save you money, eliminate your headaches, and increase your net income. And if you're a property property manager interested in applying green property management's model, give them a call at 1-866-95-GREEN or visit them on the web at greenpropertymgt.com. If you are thinking of leaving your W-2 job and becoming a full-time real estate investor, one of the greatest costs you must consider is health care for you and your family. When I made this transition myself, I found the whole health care insurance process to be confusing and frustrating. That's why I'm glad I met Chad Creasy at RCB and Associates. Chad is a professional health insurance agent who helps real estate investors and small business owners understand and choose their best health care options. And best of all, his services are covered by the the insurance company and won't cost you a dime. If you live in Michigan and are expecting a change in your health care insurance coverage for any reason or losing employer coverage or transitioning into Medicare, then you owe it to yourself to contact Chad Creasy at rcbassociatesllc.com. One of the pitfalls you see a lot of investors get into when they are rehabbing and improving their own properties is that they're just not very good at it. And then they don't do it. They put it off. They procrastinate and they end up losing money because they just don't know how to see through the actual physical improvement part. How were you able to avoid that pitfall? And are you still doing the rehab on your properties? I see a few things in there. Number one, not being able to see through it to see what the end result might be. That's something that it took me a while and maybe Tiffany a while to develop of saying, walking into a dumpster of a, of a property and visualizing what it could be. That takes time doing it a few times to see something go from A to B, right? When it comes to working on the properties, the resources I have in my toolbox are that I am handy. I am very good with a hammer. I am good at building. I'm good at drywall and electrical and plumbing. I'm good at those things, but that is my resource in my toolbox. If if you're If you're a listener on this podcast right now and you know, that you have no business holding a hammer or driving a screwdriver, you need to get your hands off of that and find someone else that can and use them and pay them because I promise you, you're going to spend a lot more money trying to figure it out or all of that time wasted wondering if you can afford someone else to do it. The answer is you can't afford to do it yourself if that resource is not in your toolbox. So there's a lot of scarcity mindset thinking that comes with that. You have to kind of come off of your pocketbook a little bit and and realize that 
you're losing more money by not taking action on hiring someone to do it for you. You know, if you hire a handyman and they they kind of do the handyman special, it's still probably better than what you would have done if that resource is not in your toolbox. So I, I've met a lot of investors that say, I worked on the first couple I did and I had no business in there. And they learned very quickly and they shared that with me. That is not what I do. That is not what I am built to do. I am built to make phone calls. I'm built to build spreadsheets. I'm built to get money together or talk to lenders or you know design and implement this you know system. That's what I'm good at. Well, that's not what I'm good at. That's what Tiffany's good at. And that's why we make such a good team is that she is all of that analytical side and the money side, and I'm the people side, and I'm the rehab side. So that's what makes us a, a very good fit. But if you're in this solo and you're doing it by yourself, figure out what's in your toolbox, what resources do you have, and you need to hire out the rest. Tiffany, talk about your side then. It sounds like you both are very complimentary in what you bring to the table. Explain in a little more detail what, what you do bring to the table, Tiffany, and how sometimes that might run counter to what Eric wants to see done. Most of our deals came off of the MLS. So I got really good at finding deals through safe searches and just knowing my criteria really well. And I really enjoyed spending the time digging through Zillow. I mean, even now I spend a lot of time showing Eric, oh my gosh, can you believe what this house is going for now? Just because the market has shifted a lot in the last year. I forced some some things on Eric over the years that he reluctantly accepted and now acknowledges that is a, a value add. In particular with renovations, I have a little bit of a project management management background. So looking at things like a Gantt chart, which lists out all the things that need to happen and the timelines. And updating those as things change really helped us complete renovations in probably half the time. And Eric hated every step of the way. But... I'm not a planner. I, I I like action. And I see action as a physical thing. And I always hated, you know, sitting down and trying to plan stuff out when I'm thinking, well, I could just go there and just do what we're planning on doing and just do it. And she's like, no, we're going to plan it all out. And it's just going to happen you know, like dominoes falling. And I'm like, it doesn't make sense. I can't see that happening because my hands aren't moving. And so there there was some back and forth on that, just trying to figure it out. Why is it that with the Gantt chart, you were able to actually accomplish things a lot faster? I mean, if you're all about action, why do you need a Gantt chart? Where did you see that difference taking place? Well, it all happened when when I realized, well, I can't do this, this, and this all at the same time, I'm only one person. And these three things on this Gantt chart can happen at the same time. We have light fixtures going in, we have the driveway to pressure wash, and we got a fence to build. So those three things can happen at the same time, but I can't do all three. So by building this Gantt chart, I can see, wow, the timeline has shrunk from seven weeks to four weeks by allowing certain secession items to happen at the same time. And I just had to, you know, take a little gut check and reality check of, I don't need to do it all. I need to trust that other people can do it while they may not do it my way. And I always think my way is the right way. It's going to still get done in a way that is good. And we, we adapted this mentality and I don't know if it's good or not, but we adapted this mentality of Gitmo, G-E-T-M-O, good enough to move on. And we, Every time something arises, we look at each other and we say, get Mo. And <laughs> we kind of shrug our shoulders like, eh, get Mo. And it's not that we're sacrificing safety or anything that makes a property less you know, safe for, for a future tenant. It's, it's really all aesthetic. And it's all like, did they put the wire on this side of the wall or this side of the wall? It's, yeah, it, we, I realized it's just not that important. We have perfectionistic tendencies between the two of us. And we realized if we make these houses absolutely perfect in the way that we think is perfect, we're never going to be able to move on. So we just had to accept, you know, it is good enough to move on. And it applies to our rentals and our personal residence. And I mean, things across every avenue of our life. Yeah. The Gantt chart forced you to realize that you needed to hire other people to do some of these other jobs so that they could all happen simultaneously and get the, the entire project done in half the amount of time. 
And by doing so, it it took Tiffany explaining one big component, and that is holding costs. And she said, so on the seven week renovation, or actually let's let's build it out, on a six month renovation, if we do it your way, we have three extra months of holding costs that are going to be three thousand dollars a month. So that is nine thousand dollars in holding costs that we are we're forking out just by letting you do all the work. But if we can cut it down to three months and we utilize this Gantt chart and other people are working, we will save a collective of twenty five hundred dollars by hiring out those other tasks. And so in my mind, I'm like, well, money saved. That's yeah. great. And then not only just the holding cost, but the opportunity cost of that property being ready to rent sooner. And so, you're moved on to the next property. Yeah. What are you using to do your Gantt chart? Just Excel or Google Sheets, actually. So you can you can do a Gantt chart and and Excel and Google. Sheet. Yeah, it's very very basic. I mean, it is not something that I would present in a corporate setting, but it gets us through. And but it's Getmo. Yeah, it is exactly. Getmo. That's right. It helps us also manage our subcontractors mm -hmm. so that we don't have overlap in a way that would be frustrating for our contractors. So it's it has worked really well for us and we're using it on the property we're renovating for ourselves now i think we'll use it on every renovation even small ones along those lines tiffany a uh, hack or app that you can't do without i think zillow and redfin and all the those apps because that's where i i run all my comps for rentals for property appraisals all that good stuff eric what about you hack or app that you can't do without i think my hack would be people and it would be relationships, picking up the phone and checking in with people, making sure that everyone's taken care of, especially contractors. Your relationships go a long way. And if you can just nurture and keep them in a positive place, you will see how far they can carry you. So my hack is definitely people. Tell us a little bit about your book. Tell us why you wrote this and how people can find it and also find out more about you. The Pathfinder's Journey is a book that walks you down a very similar path that we walk down, but it's not necessarily our tell all. It's not our memoir. It is a book where a young couple move into this new town and their life is interrupted by a helpful neighbor that helps them move a fridge. And he gives them some sweet tea, brings them in their house. And they see all of this, all these pictures on the wall of things that their family does. And they wonder, how does he do it? How does he have the time and, and finances to achieve all the things in these pictures? And he reveals to them that he's a real estate investor and that his family has time and financial freedom. They become very interested in it. And over the course of this book, you just follow their journey on the five pillars of success. And those five pillars are, one, discover your why. You know, find what brings the most joy and happiness in your life so that they have a full tank of gas when getting into the path of real estate investing. Creating the roadmap is pillar two, writing in detail what that dream life looks like three years from now and then every three years succinctly after that. Changing your mindset, changing your thoughts to change your life. There's a big section on that. Designing the lifestyle to build lasting habits and to build a good community and how to sacrifice things in your current life to live a better dream life. And then the last one is setting big, huge goals and just kind of coaching, well, the mentor coaches, the the main characters on how to set these really big lifestyle goals. And we we wrote this because we set a huge goal of when we had our first son, I didn't want to have to go back to work after maternity leave. And we found a way to make it happen to where my maternity pay ended and I ran the numbers and we had hit our number. So we were able to accomplish this in such a short period of time because we had these five pillars with a very clear plan and defined goals that helped us achieve it. And we are now, we're expecting our second child in the next few weeks. So we're looking forward to living our dream life and growing our family and using real estate to to make it happen. Yeah. And if anything, a reader out there, it's going to take you four or five hours to read this book. It's a quick read. It's a very entertaining read. From what I've heard, the comments uh, reflect that. And you can find it on Amazon, pretty much on, on Amazon, The Pathfinder's Journey. There is a Kindle version. There's a paperback version. And there is a audible version as well. What's the best way to find out more about you or get a hold of you? We're on all social media platforms. Uh, on Purpose Investor is our handle everywhere. So Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, 
And then if you want to email us or talk to us directly, I'm Eric at on in, onpurposeinvestor.com. And Tiffany at onpurposeinvestor.com. Mm-hmm. Tiffany, Eric, congratulations on your second child. Congratulations on achieving financial independence and, and also on completing your book and getting it out there into the world. It's, it's been a real pleasure talking with you both. Thank you so much for having this conversation. Thank you, Brian. I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode. I'm your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. And you can find out more about me by going to higinvestor.com. That's H-I-G investor.com. And you can also ask questions and join us on Facebook by going to RPOA, Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast. This episode was sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com and RCB and Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. You've been listening to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association. You can find out more at rpoaonline.org. If you enjoyed this podcast, please go to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and review. 